Hello, I'm Dr. Eben Alexander, former neurosurgeon and author of several books, Proof of Heaven, uh, Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe, that really all address a near-death experience that I had. Uh, I had spent the first 54 years of my life honing a very kind of conventional scientific worldview. As much as I had attended church in my youth and, and wanted to believe much of what I heard there, my scientific career left me wondering how conscious awareness could survive the death of the brain and body. And I think that's why I was gifted with such an extraordinary experience, but it, it didn't come cheap. I really had to almost die. And all that happened November 10th, 2008, when I woke up with severe headaches, severe back pain. And within two or three hours, I was having grand mal seizures. I was deep in coma. I was then taken to the uh, emergency room where they diagnosed me with a gram negative bacterial meningoencephalitis, which is about the worst kind of meningitis you can have. But to me, it was an extraordinary gift. And that came mainly in the form of the medically documented damage to my neocortex. And according to modern neuroscience, all the details of our conscious awareness depend on the integrity of the neocortex. And yet mine was taken down by this uh, incredibly powerful, aggressive, and should have killed me uh, bacterial infection was it was clear to me that my brain was too damaged to have any kind of dream or hallucination. So how in the world does this extraordinary, ultra real, memorable, life-changing set of events occur when my brain was so demonstrably offline? Well, to share my story with you, it, uh, it's important to point out that my near-death experience does have one major atypical feature, and that was the fact that I was amnesic that I had no memory of Eben Alexander's life during my coma experience. That part is unusual for NDEs, but over the next months and years after recovering from my illness, it became clear to me why I would have to go through such an extraordinary journey to come to these deep lessons. So it started out in what I call the earthworm's eye view, a very primitive, coarse, unresponsive realm. It was like being in dirty jello. I do remember kind of a feeling, not just of uh, what I saw and kind of heard, but also what I could feel it was this uh, tactile sensation of being surrounded by roots or blood vessels. And although it sounds very foreboding to talk about it, given I had no memory of anything else, I had no words, no language, no memory of Evan Alexander's life, none of my religious concepts or knowledge of this universe or of humanity, uh, that gave me an empty slate. And that's what allowed for an especially deep and profound and far reaching journey with a tremendous number of very important lessons uh, bundled with it. Now, from this uh, earthworm I view, luckily I was rescued. There came a slowly spinning pure white light that was surrounded by fine silvery and golden tendrils. And as this white light came towards me, slowly spinning, I noticed it had a musical melody. And that became very important as a theme because what we remember is music, notes, frequency. Those kind of things can actually serve to allow our soul to traverse these various levels. So sound was a very important concept, although I hope people realize that in those realms, far beyond the here and now and the sense of the physical, sound can go way beyond what we normally think of as music in this uh, four-dimensional space-time. It can be far more extraordinary. It's really coming kind of from Plato's world of ideals. And that was kind of the music I heard. And that's what ushered me up through this portal that led from that uh, primitive subterranean earthworm's eye view up into this rich, ultra real gateway valley. Uh, and the gateway valley was where so much of the action happened in this journey, although it was not the ultimate destination as I'll explain in a few minutes. But the Gateway Valley was kind of an intersection point with lots of kind of earth-like features. I would, what have you were all demonstrating this dynamic, rich explosion of life and of meaning and of power and of existence, of will, of this sentience. It was just an amazing thing to live through and, and to witness. The amazing thing for most people uh, to understand is that it was much more real than this world. It was packed with kind of meaning and uh, the, the extent of of uh, kind of existence. And to me, it was a very instructive and informative. And not only that, it was very comforting. I remember beside me on the butterfly wing was a beautiful young woman, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones, broad smile, high forehead. She never said a word to me. She never had to. But her message, which I think was the central message I was to bring back to this world, was very simple. 
uh, and it was delivered telepathically, emotionally, connecting with her soul. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are deeply cared for. And I cannot tell you how affirming and refreshing that message was, especially coming in the setting of that extraordinary earthworm eye view and the ascendance through this portal up into this ultra real gateway valley. That was truly an extraordinary uh, transformation. And the interesting thing is how much it felt like home. It was a spiritual home uh, that was very reassuring. I think to me, especially in retrospect, one of the biggest surprises was how beautiful and accepting that realm was. Now in that setting, I remember also seeing below us in this meadow, thousands of beings dancing, lots of joy and merriment. And I remember seeing all of that and uh, this beautiful girl on the butterfly wing, and they all, all dressed in the same kind of simple garb, and yet it was very colorful. Our power and the majesty and the personal kind of nature of that infinitely loving God force that was present all throughout these heavenly scenes and extending down to the lowest levels of the material realm and then all the way up to the highest levels that I ascended to in this journey. After witnessing that soft breeze and it's uh, bringing to my awareness the power of that uh, infinite uh, God force, that healing force of love and compassion and kindness, that's when the journey really opened up and that gateway became just that, a gateway, because in fact, all the joy and merriment were being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs of angelic choirs that were emanating chants, anthems, hymns that would just thunder through my awareness and uh, reverberate with this kind of oneness of love and of meaning and purpose and existence. And what I witnessed, these angelic choirs providing yet another portal, a wormhole up into higher and higher levels. And at that point, I remember seeing all of four dimensional space time and the lowest material realms collapsing down. And then all of that spiritual realm that I was just now visiting and getting to know in this uh, profound fashion with a different uh, causal ordering that I call deep time. Important to point out, for example, life reviews, which you've often heard about, your life flashing before your eyes, those go back at least 2,400 years in the literature on near-death experiences. And the life review is remarkable for two main facts. One is that these are not just a vague sepia-tinted remembering of various events, but they're an actual reliving of events in our lives. And interestingly, we don't experience it so much from our perspective as from the emotional perspective perspective of those around us who were influenced by our actions and even our thoughts. That's a really crucial thing to get about life reviews because it's showing us that we relive the event. And part of that is the ability to learn and transform from those that reliving. And the reliving, of course, involves dissolution of this apparent boundary of self that we normally live through, uh, you know, in this world in these bodies. But in the life review, the fact that we're sharing the dream of the one mind seems to kind of come to the fore. It's still clear that we have free will, that our choices about how we deal with ourselves and others is very important in all of this. And in fact, determines kind of our soul journey in this unfolding. So from this point of this gateway valley and the many Earth-like features, what happened was there was this next portal up. And that's when I saw all of the time and the material realm collapsing down, deep time and the spiritual realm. Deep time allows for things like life reviews to be a, a real reliving and not just a remembering of events. And deep time also allows basically the transformation and evolution of all consciousness, which I think is what is going on here. So in other words, just remember that what we view as earth time is just here to support the drama when our lives are unfolding as we live them, but that there's a much deeper and richer way of looking at it that can include this kind of phenomenon of life reviews and kind of a mid-course correction that is also showing us that the boundaries of self are a fiction. And from that, I ascended up through this next light portal up into what I call the core. It was an infinite inky blackness, but filled to overflowing with this divine and infinitely healing God force of love, kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance, forgiveness, all of the deepest and most profound principles of interactions of sentient beings in our journey of discovery. In that core realm, I witnessed the entire higher dimensional multiverse shrunken down to this complex oversphere as a teaching tool for many of the lessons to be provided there. Uh, had visions of like what I call the flying fish uh, vision and the Indra's net vision that showed me very clear 
life reviews and reincarnation in this very profound package that showed that our souls ascend towards oneness with the divine, but it cannot occur in one physical lifetime. So by necessity, it involves several lifetimes. And of course, I came back to this world shocked by that revelation because I'd never studied the scientific evidence for reincarnation before. Now, in my journey in that core realm, in the core itself was this oneness with the divine. And I came back realizing that that deity, and I call that deity, as I describe in the book, Proof of Heaven, I call that deity Om, because when I came back from my coma, the word God was a puny little human word with a ton of baggage to it. And I realized it didn't matter if you were going to label that infinite force of love and compassion and wholeness at the very source of our conscious awareness. If you wanted to call it God or Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, I don't care. That debate is meaningless. The reality of that infinitely loving force at the core of existence is what indie ears have been reporting for thousands of years. And that is the important lesson is that the ambience of this universe, uh, when we look at it through the raw data of personal experience of human beings who have had near death experiences, which are out there by the millions, what we end up discovering is that this universe, that background, is one of harmony, is one of love and peace, uh, and one of prosperity for all, which is certainly not something that is what emerges through the translation into our current material realm and the human situation. And that's why I think it's so important that we've had 5,000 years for religions to try and teach us these deep lessons of love, one is compassion and kindness, that indie ears have been uh, screaming from the rooftops for thousands of years. But now that the science of consciousness is allowing us to demonstrate that science fully supports the reality of these kind of journeys, it doesn't defy it as the materialist neuroscientist in me would have tried to argue before my coma. But in fact, very consistent with the emerging science of consciousness is a vision of this oneness and love, the spiritual uh, nature that we share. And that was apparent to me, especially as I would oscillate through these various levels to my journey, because in that core realm, with uh, so much revealed about uh, sentience and the transformation and evolution of all consciousness, I would suddenly find myself back down in that earth where my view. Important thing is I noticed very quickly by remembering the musical notes of the melody, I was able to conjure up that light portal that took me back up into the Gateway Valley yet again, always reassured each time I entered there by that beautiful young woman, my spiritual companion on the butterfly way. And then I would ascend up through those angelic choirs again to the core realm. This happened multiple times. And every time entering the core, I was informed, you're not here to stay, you'll be going back. I had come to believe that going back was actually going back to the earthworm's eye view. And I seemed to have solved that problem because I now knew I could remember the musical notes, the melody, and always resurrect those pathways up into the gateway valley, and then even deeper into the sanctum, sanctorum of the divine in the core realm. But they weren't kidding. And there came a time when I tried to conjure up remembering the musical notes, the melody, and it no longer worked. So I was stuck down in those murkiest levels akin to the earthworm's eye view. You. But I also knew at that point that I could trust that I would be taken care of, that the universe had a deep love for me and that that would be honored in anything moving forward. And it was at that point that I witnessed thousands of beings going off into the distance around me, heads bowed, some holding candles, some with uh, hands up like this. And this murmuring energy coming from them was surprising to me. And the surprise was in that I felt this tremendous comfort and that feeling of a spiritual home that was similar to what I'd felt in the Gateway Valley and in the core realm. But now I was feeling Feeling it right here in this moment in uh, kind of stuck in that never never land of the earthworm's eye view and yet all of these beings were generating this energy that was welcoming me back somewhere I didn't know where to and with me that's exactly what it was and it showed how by going into the mental realm and prayer and meditation in this world we can easily connect with loved ones who have uh, transitioned into those other realms and that's an important lesson to learn for all of us especially with all the death and bereavement in the world world today with COVID, with the economic collapse uh, generated by COVID, uh, with war in Ukraine and all the uh, kind of hardships, political polarization. Sometimes it's hard to remember that we're truly all in this together. The deepest lesson coming from NDEs is one of harmony, 
togetherness, kindness, compassion, mercy, taking care of each other, taking care of the least, the last, and the lost, of the refugees, of the homeless. It is time for us to really rise up as homo sapiens and honor these deep lessons from NDEs. It turns out for me, the last part of my journey was uh, then witnessing six faces that would kind of bubble up out of the muck. They'd say a few words and then they disappear back into the muck. I can remember them today as if the whole thing happened this morning. Those memories are so sharp and crystal clear. And yet I also realized when I first saw those faces, I had no idea who they were. That was part of my amnesia, which was still very much in effect, even at the end of seven days in coma, because this was an impartial NDE. It was not a complete death experience. So I was not going to be recovering those memories, but I had witnessed, you know, life reviews and reincarnation very strongly in those visions in the core realm. So there were plenty of lessons about how all this worked when I was coming back to this world. Those six faces provided what are called veridical time anchors. Five of them were physically present in the ICU room the last 24 hours of my coma. And that's especially noteworthy because many of the family and friends present during the main part of my coma, I had no memory of whatsoever. So what that helped to do is to show that the vast majority of the coma experience had to happen between days one and four or one and five of that coma. And I explain all that in the book, Proof of Heaven, about the timing of it. But those are very important points that were also emphasized by the medical case report that came out in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in September 2018 by the three doctors who were absolutely astonished by my recovery, which has no precedent in the medical literature. And that's really why they wrote the case up. And interestingly enough, when they were challenged by the peer review editors of the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases, how do you explain this? This case is absurd. This kind of patient doesn't have a full recovery. And that's when the three physicians who wrote the case report said it's because he had a near-death experience that he was granted this, you know, miraculous recovery. And that was really kind of the key. And for the peer review editors of the journal, that was sufficient. They said, okay, that explains it. We'll go on and publish. But that I think should indicate to the world, the scientific community is waking up to the reality of kind of our spiritual nature and its importance in our healing and becoming more whole. That's basically uh, for me, what spirituality is. It's just a sense of connectedness through this one mind uh, that we're all connected through that one mind, we're sharing a consciousness. That is one of the most profound lessons emerging from the modern science of consciousness studies. And also, of course, about the binding force of love. And it's important in healing. One of the reasons our world has so much sickness and toxicity is, it, is that lack of love for self and others. And the more each and every one of us can use prayer and meditation in our life experience to harvest that love the universe has for us, serve as a conduit to share it with our fellow beings. That's how this world can wake up to a far more more harmonious, prosperous, and meaningful future and destiny for humanity to contribute to the well-being of life on this planet. Now, when I first woke up from that coma after seeing those six faces at the very end of it all, it's important to point out that the one that brought me back was a 10-year-old boy. It was my son, Bon. Now, of course, I did not recognize him at the time because of my amnesia. And it was the seventh day of coma, Sunday morning, they had protected Bond from the worst news during most of that week. They held a family conference where the doctors said I'd gone from 10% down to 2% chance of survival, but no realistic prospects for recovery. That's why they recommended stopping the antibiotics, letting nature take its course. And Bond had been protected from the worst news during most of that week, but he heard that and he knew it was bad. He ran down the hallway into major bay 10 of the ICU. I was lying there on my hospital bed on my ventilator as I had been for seven days in my process of dying. That's when he pulled open my eyelids, one eye looking over here, another eye over there, neither pupil working. Those of you in medicine know that's a horrible scene. And I promise you, I did not hear him with the ears. I did not see him with my eyes. I was too far gone from this physical world and this physical body, but the message came through. He was pleading with me, Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. As if somehow that would make it so. And that message got through. And even though I didn't understand what I was to do from that point on, my will was able to bring me back to him. I realized that I had a responsibility to another soul. And so far in this journey, I had thought it can continue. It can cease. It doesn't matter. Now, all of a sudden it mattered when I saw that sixth face pleading with me, even though I didn't understand the words, but that emotional connection of his pleading, I knew I had to come back. And that's when I came back to this world. And when 
I did, my brain was still so wrecked from the meningitis that waking up in that ICU bed surrounded by my mother, my sisters, my sons, my former spouse, I had no idea who these beings were. My amnesia was still very much in effect. But my language, which had been completely deleted, came back very rapidly, uh, literally over hours and days, childhood memories over a few weeks, all my semantic knowledge, cosmology, physics, neuroscience, returned over about two months. Now I've spent the 14 years since my coma diving deep with other scientists, with other experiencers, and really getting into this mystery of consciousness and the nature of reality in our universe. And it's a tremendous gift to get rid of the bleak and paltry fiction of materialism, which falsely claims that our existence is birth to death and nothing more, and that we're no more than our physical bodies. In fact, that materialist science would try, would scoff at you if you claim to have free will, because that conventional material of scientists of science believes that it's all chemical reactions, electron fluxes conspiring to fool us into a notion of free will where they're all just following the laws of physics, chemistry, biology. That is not true. And that's where a quantum informed uh, version of consciousness is what is taking the world by storm. It will take a few years to filter through to the general public, but the reality is we live in a mental spiritual universe with top-down causality. We're all in this together. And the binding force of love with the human experiences of kindness, compassion, mercy, and acceptance are the absolute rules of our existence. The sooner we remember that deep truth, the better. And that is for me the essential lesson that emerges from my near-death experience and from interpreting it in a modern scientific perspective.